A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high, just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human remblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which they had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquaintance acquaintance with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is laid to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken from the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his truth and his tomb, tomb, tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall pro- prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered by the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us all say together verses 1 through 11 through the tw- for the, from the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. 
All All who see me laugh me to scorn. They They curl curl their their lips and and wag their their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. You have entrusted you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God.
Will the readers please come forward? <clears throat> The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the religious leaders that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They will know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I had spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. 
Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? If this man were not a criminal, he would not have handed him over to you. Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. We are are not not permitted to put put anyone anyone to to death. death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So, you are a king? You say I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into this world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the people again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you this king of the Jews? Not Not this this man, man, but but Barabbas. Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is your man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, They shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. We We have have a law, law, and according according to that law, he he ought ought to to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Therefore, Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? You have no power over me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the people cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the people, Here is your king. Away Away with with him. him. Away Away with with him. him. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? We We have have no no king king but but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, they did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate, to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. When the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things... Joseph Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the religious authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, They laid Jesus there. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, amen. Please be seated.
Growing up, the hours between 12 and 3 on Friday, and after that, when Jesus was in the tomb, we were encouraged to be in a quiet space and let God speak. Let God speak to us about the events in Jesus' passion and death. Not an easy request, because the evening is beautiful, the day was gorgeous, and we are asked to discipline ourselves and to reflect on difficult things. Life and death, violence and power, anti-Semitism, We live in the knowledge that the resurrection is to come. So maybe that makes it a little bit easier. But this is the time that we are called to be in that space of listening. We're encouraged to give the text a rereading, a new meaning, to understand what they might mean for us now. There are texts that are meant to fulfill prophetic texts in the Hebrew scriptures, Jesus' predictions in the gospel. And so when reading this text again, we can see something new, a new perspective, and confirm what Jesus had predicted about himself. So, To give you a start, I'll give you kind of a checklist that I've come up with. In the Gospel of John in general, and these chapters in particular, Jesus behaves not as a victim, but as a victor. He is a commanding presence, a divine presence that makes the soldiers and the temple police fall to the ground. He does not apologize for having answered disrespectfully to the high priest. He knows that the kind of death he's facing, he knows what it is. He doesn't ask God to spare his life as he does in the other three gospels, but rather has the foreknowledge of what is going to happen to him. He takes away Pilate's power when Pilate tries to assert it by telling him that he received his power from above. He's not an actor, but he's the subject of a higher power. And finally, at the cross, he decides when he's going to die in this gospel. He gives up the spirit when he knows that everything is finished. And he has played the part that God wanted him to play. There are a couple of items that happen in this gospel that need to be seen in context. And that is that this gospel was maybe written 60 or 90 years after the events occurred. We can think of the Jews in several ways. They're really people from Judea, the crowd. The whole crowd is simply people from Judea. So we would call them Judeans. And Hebrew and Latin and Greek were at the time Aramaic, Roman language, and Hellenistic language. So it's not unusual that those should be posted. There's a separate notion that Hebrew leaders were there, and they were. And they were questioning as they should have, because they're coming from the law, and they want to know who Jesus is. And I have to think that if I were in their shoes, 
I would be asking those questions too. But the question I have, and many people have, about John in his gospel is that the way he uses the Jews is very, very dangerous because it feeds into the historical antisemitism that has caused so much persecution and murder over the years from antiquity to the present. Here's some other things to think about. Jesus was defiant. He forgoes violence and he accepts his role in God's plan. He doesn't allow anything or anybody, in this case Peter, to deter him and deprive him from his final victory. The garden that he's in is very public. It's very public. It's a well-known place. People wander through it. So Jesus wants to know, wants people to know where he is and what's happening. And between Peter's first and last denial, Jesus is being interrogated by Annas, as we heard, and again, he is defiant. And then there's Pilate. Pilate, in all his sarcasm, in all his condescending cat and mouse game, we would say, with Jesus. Pilate, of course, wants to humiliate. And still, Jesus never loses cool. Never. Never. Even when he's presented in a purple robe and tells people, and Pilate tells people, the Judeans, that they can crucify him if they want to. And finally, on the cross. He decides when he would die. In burial, we find two secret disciples. And that, too, is something for us to meditate on. So I'm asking you, when you're thinking about these things, about this very, very, very ghastly path that Jesus had to walk, are you prepared to enter into a time of meditation? You could think about what are the assumptions we make about others that we might want to review and maybe change and give new meaning. We could think about things that are happening today. I left a flyer outside and the bishop has written about this today. About maybe we have lots of suffering and death going on right, right, right here on the border with the refugee population. And Good Friday might be a time to think about that. Those are just a couple things. I'm sure you can think of others, but I invite you to use this time to discipline yourself and listen to God on very, very difficult questions and see how they might help you to bring new meaning. We have the flicker of the resurrection coming. So now is the time. Please stand and I will read the solemn collects.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for our bishop and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized all over the world, and for us who will renew our baptismal vows, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for the President of the United States for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase, until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the physically challenged, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and the bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in God's mercy, will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin, or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all, all those who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray 
that there may be one flock and one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence. Carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were being cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We will sing a hymn and then have an opportunity to venerate the cross.
Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the world's salvation. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I led you out of slavery into freedom and delivered you through the waters of rebirth, but you have prepared a cross for your savor.
my people, O my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. Forty years I led you through the desert, feeding you with manna on the way. I served you from the time of trial. I saved you and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire, but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you by the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I planted you as my fairest vineyard, but you brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of vine and never left your side, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I poured out saving water from the rock, but you gave me vinegar to drink. I poured out my life and gave you the new covenant in my blood, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom and crowned you with eternal life, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. I gave you my peace, but you draw your sword in my name. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I opened the waters to lead you to the promised land, but you opened my side with a spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me high on a cross. I raised you from death and prepared for you the tree of life, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I grafted you into my people Israel, but you have made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. O my people, O my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I came to you in the least of your brothers and sisters, but I was hungry and gave me no food, thirsty and you gave me no drink, a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy 
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. 